illegal street racing in the early morning hours of Sunday, putting drivers in danger and frustrating residents who were woken up by all that noise. The dangerous driving happened at the intersection of Mount Royal Avenue and North Avenue. It's a heavily trafficked area in the shadow of I-83. The incident started around 2 a.m., lasting for at least an hour. This round of illegal drag racing and drifting prompting questions about why police didn't do more to stop the commotion sooner. Yet another disruption keeping Baltimore residents on edge. Kate Daniels looks into the safety concerns raised at a public comment meeting with city leaders tonight. And Mackenzie Frost is following a spree of juvenile car thefts across our area. But our team coverage begins with Rebecca Pryor live at that street racing intersection with the latest on the investigation. Rebecca? Mary and Kai, I'm told it was like watching a part out of a Fast and Furious movie. Take a look. They're faint, but you can even see remaining at the scene, tire marks are here, remnants of what residents are calling a chaotic night. I thought, oh boy. At the intersection of North and Mount Royal Avenue. There's some drama happening out there. I a total takeover. There was just a lot of tire screeching. It sounded like there was just like a continuous revving. Reckless driving caught on camera. Various cars doing endless donuts and burnouts with large crowds standing dangerously close to the action. Causing major safety concerns and blocking traffic along several busy streets. Which happens from time to time, but not at the hours that we were hearing it. It was just a lot more excessive on Saturday night. Those living nearby claiming the chaos. Continuing for about an hour, if not longer, starting around 1.30 in the morning. At some point, just kind of like, stop. <laughs> Late last year, Mayor Brandon Scott signing a bill to pump the brakes on Baltimore City street racing. It's the strictest in the state. The new law carrying a $1,000 fine or one year in jail for incidents like these. However, proof of enforcement has yet to be seen. In this case, BBD says 911 calls for street-related disturbances, racing vehicles, and disorderly conduct coming in around 1.36 a.m. Drag racing occurring. They were blocking the roads everywhere. According to BPD, officers arriving less than 10 minutes later, but the scene completely clear. However, it was so loud. One resident who asked we not identify her. I called and they did not do anything. Painting a different picture. And they just sat right by the intersection with their lights on. Why do you think they weren't getting out of the car? <sighs> Maybe they felt like they were in danger. Fox 45 sending follow-up questions to BPD asking exactly how many officers responded and why do some say police stayed in their cars amid the chaos? Blue and red lights flashing. I also heard sirens. So far, no response. It kept me from feeling it peace and at home. Meanwhile, the combination of high crime and events like these. Enough to drive some residents out of the city. Are you planning on leaving Baltimore City? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. And what's brought you to that decision? My safety, the safety of my dogs, the quality of life. Now I also asked BPD for the number of fines and arrests that have been made since that new street racing law went into effect late last year. But they told me it would take them at least a day to track that data down. Reporting live in North Baltimore, Rebecca Pryor, Fox 45 News. Thank you, Rebecca. And it's not just street racing. BPD is also cracking down on illegal dirt bike riders. Police have seized more than 100 dirt bikes so far this year and made 17 arrests just for dirt bike riding. Early this summer, officers recovered 33 illegal dirt bikes from a Mondawmin business. We are following more breaking news. A 16-year-old is dead after a double shooting in East Baltimore. Police say it happened along North Broadway around 6 o'clock tonight. A 26-year-old was also shot. Both victims were hit multiple times by bullets, and the 26-year-old is currently at the hospital. This is an ongoing investigation, but again, a 16-year-old was killed tonight. Anybody with information is asked to call Baltimore police. This shooting comes as Mayor Brandon Scott and Acting Police Commissioner Richard Worley hold their third public comment meeting and the first one in person. Baltimore residents take the opportunity to voice their concerns about safety amid a violent summer. Fox 45's Keith Daniels was at that meeting tonight, and he joins us now with their message. Keith? Well, Kai, it was a packed house for the mayor and the Acting Police Commissioner. Residents showed up with their concerns and questions for the mayor and for the man 
who wants to be the permanent police commissioner. And we pray tonight will be productive. At the Lord's Church in Park Heights. Amen. A town hall in the outreach center with Mayor Brandon Scott and acting police commissioner Richard Worley. And welcome to Mayor Scott and Commissioner Burley com community engagement session. Among those residents in the audience, 75-year-old Horatio Rice. <laughs> right. Sitting in his chair, waiting for his time to rise at the mic with questions. Top of mind for Mr. Rice. The crime is terrible. Notably, he says, around his church nearby on Garrison Boulevard. At the church, man, they, they can't worship down there. There's so much stuff going on. The mayor and his nominee for police commissioner on the road for public feedback. These meetings really are about you all. Their first in-person meeting at the Lord's Church. The mayor calling the meetings an opportunity to discuss how best to build a safer Baltimore and to hear from residents about what they want to see from the city's commissioner. For the mayor, top priority, building public trust. We press the mayor on what that will take, the one thing to make that happen. There's multiple things, and it's also different from community to community, district to district, neighborhood to neighborhood, person by person. At this meeting, residents stepping to the mic with their concerns. A couple of questions uh, for each of you. Ranging from community engagement to police brutality. How are corrupt, rogue police officers going to be handled? We are a totally different department. We basically do not want to have any bad cops. And there was the matter of residency. We need more officers to actually live in the city to help pay some of these taxes that is all of us affected by. Near the end of the line, Mr. Rice at the mic with those concerns about the crime and the criminals that congregate around his church. You know, I've chased people off the steps myself, but you know, that's not my job. So. Yeah, so we, we need to see some police. I think Michelle's back there. She can link you right with your major who can get that address and help you out and contact you and work to make sure that your uh, people are coming to church safely and going home. Well, there were also questions about that deadly mass shooting that devastated the Brooklyn Homes community last month. Worley repeated what he said at a council hearing, and that is he admitted mistakes were made and he's working to see that it does not happen again. Meantime, the next in-person meeting happens, the in-person town hall happens next Tuesday evening at the Shake and Bake Family Fun Center in West Baltimore. We're live tonight, Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Keith, thank you. Well, new tonight, we're learning a 15-year-old has been charged following an armed carjacking in Edgewater in late June. Police say a group of four people, including the teen, carjacked a woman in her driveway, pulling a gun on her and forcing her out of the car. Now, this comes on the heels of a high-speed chase in Baltimore over the weekend in which four juveniles were detained, but an 11-year-old was let go. Fox 45's Mackenzie Frost has more on another example of young people not facing charges. On Friday night, Baltimore police say four young people took off in a vehicle stolen from Baltimore County and ended up in the city. And we know lawmakers are already taking a look at potential changes to the juvenile justice laws with a hearing scheduled in September. But a political analyst says one hearing is not enough. Westbound on Jefferson and turning northbound on Curly. Friday night in Baltimore City. Occupied multiple times with you and I. After a Hyundai Elantra was reported stolen in Baltimore County. Driving like it's a mail. Everyone's getting out. All the doors opening. You got one, two, three, four, five. Looks like you about 10 years old. Baltimore police eventually catching up to two 14 year olds, a 13 year old, and an 11 year old. He's making that left hand turn right off the 500 block of Decker. Looks like he just threw the car keys. Decker and Jefferson. BPD later telling Fox 45 News the 11 year old boy could not be charged due to the Juvenile Justice Reform Act. This isn't the first time this law has prevented a kid from facing charges. It's pretty bad out here. A stolen car in Brooklyn Park earlier this month caught on surveillance video. Five of the seven kids involved were old enough to face charges, but two others were not. The 11 and the 12 year old, had it been a carjacking or an attempted carjacking, 
that meets the criteria um, for those offenders to be charged. This criminal behavior isn't just a problem in the Baltimore region. Down near D.C., leaders facing the same problem. Prince George's County Executive Angela also Brooks. We have 15 and 14 year olds running about our community at 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, armed and dangerous, um, unaccountable and unafraid. And the PG County Police squarely putting the blame at the feet of lawmakers. Under the new laws of the state of Maryland, uh, it, it has become more difficult uh, for police uh, to question young people uh, about anything. The Juvenile Justice Reform Act has different pieces. One, kids under 13 cannot be charged with certain crimes. Another prevents police from talking to juveniles without informing their parent and getting an attorney first, even if they're a witness to a crime. I think it's imperative for the legislature to start planning stuff now. Political analyst John Deedy says the work in Annapolis often moves slow. That's why it needs to start now, before the first bell of the General Assembly session rings. So that way when you come back in January, you've got the bill basically ready and you can start with the public hearings. The House and Senate Judicial Committees are planning a hearing in September to start the process. Everybody's got a different idea as to what they would like to do going forward. Delegate Luke Klippinger of Baltimore City, chair of the House Committee, says his hearing will focus on the Department of Juvenile Services. What's becoming clear is that the Department of Juvenile Services doesn't have the services and doesn't have a plan to deal with kids who are in possession of, of guns. Whether these hearings will result in changes proposed to current laws remains uncertain, but Didi says one one hearing, one time, is not enough, and any legislation crafted should not be introduced like anything else. Emergency legislation could be a good idea because it would show a sense of urgency. If passed, emergency legislation could have immediate effect, potentially giving tools to prosecutors and police to start curbing the surge of young people getting involved in crime. Governor Westmore's team tells me that there have been meetings taking place this summer with local leaders, prosecutors, and police all talking about juvenile justice laws. But it's unclear what, if any, policy proposals could come out of those meetings, potentially turning into legislation in January. In the newsroom, Mackenzie Frost, Fox 45 News. That brings us to our question of the day. Are lawmakers reacting quickly enough to the juvenile crime crisis? So far, 96% of those who voted say no. You can make your voice heard by going to foxbaltimore.com slash vote.